Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Noah Israel, and I'm part of the marketing team here at Anadot. Um, and we will soon be starting our webinar on the best practices for building a stable data pipeline in Telco. Um, we will be hearing today from Vikram, who is the Senior Director of Solutions Engineering here at Anadot. He has been working with us for nearly four years now. And prior to this role, Vikram worked with the Telco in Australia, heading up their data engineering team. He has worked in the Telco industry for the past 20 years with various Telco infrastructure vendors across the globe. So he, would, he will be bringing his expertise and base, vast knowledge in the Telco industry to our webinar today. Should you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A bottom you see at the bottom of your screen. We will dedicate a few minutes at the end of the session to answer as many as possible. I'd also like to note that this, this webinar will be recorded and the link will be sent to your emails in the next few days. And lastly, we plan on doing more of these telco related webinars in the future, so stay tuned for any updates. Hope you enjoy the webinar and without further ado, Vikram. Uh, thanks, Noah. Um, welcome everyone for uh, this webinar. Uh, the focus of the webinar is how to build uh, data pipelines uh, and the focus of this talk will be on the, the telco industry. Um, and we've, as Anadart, have been working with telco industries and other large enterprises building uh, business autonomous monitoring solutions. Uh, and for that, uh, we work with a lot of data. And so from where we stand, uh, we see uh, uh, our customers uh, building uh, data pipelines uh, so that you know, we use that data to monitor their business. So uh, you know, the purpose of this web webinar is to share uh, our collective experience and observations on how to build efficient, scalable data pipelines. Uh, and it's a huge uh, general topic across telco and non-telco uh, businesses. So let's get started um, and uh, go through this uh, in a little bit more detail. So I'll share my screen. Okay. Um, so Noah, can you see the screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Great. Okay. So uh, so just as a uh, agenda for today, uh, we'll quickly have a discussion around the background and motivation for this talk. What are the data challenges in a telco environment? Uh, and then talk a little bit about the building blocks of data pipelines, uh, and then touch briefly on a important, uh, but often forgotten subject of data quality and um, leave some time for a and A. Okay, so uh, just as uh, background and motivation, uh, if you generally go and do a survey and talk to the senior decision makers in the in the telco industry on you know what are their key priorities for the next uh, three to five years, um, a lot of them uh, will generally uh, respond uh, in these four categories. So the first is five G rollout, uh, you know, getting the right spectrum. Uh, finding the right use cases, um, trying to understand what's the right architecture, uh, getting trying to get into uh, you know new markets and finding new business cases and potentially you know getting into uh, private five G uh, markets. So this is kind of a key area that dominates thinking. Uh, the other part would be to uh, build fiber everywhere. So the last uh, two years of the pandemic has taught us that reliable high-speed internet access across you know, businesses, homes is, uh, is, 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 is a pretty much a, a important function of society. So uh, operators are rolling out fiber everywhere. Um, and then when you look at uh, you know, what's happening inside their network, uh, a lot of operators are thinking about evolving to a cloud native uh, architecture or network. So to be able to move away from uh, proprietary monolith monolithic networks to um, things which can be built on at cloud scale in the cloud, things like Open RAN or 5G standalone core and so on. Um, and 
uh, the fourth um, pillar, let's call it, uh, is to shut down um, the legacy technology. So legacy uh, in some markets is 2G, some markets it's 3G, and of course, um, you know, everybody wants to shut down copper uh, on the fixed side. So largely these are the four uh, priorities. Um, and then um, typically uh, you get to hear about a fifth one, which is thrown in, which is automation. So, you know, uh, you know, the idea here is that you need to have automation underpinning all these major transformations, right? Um, so, uh, you know, the, the line of argument is that without automation, I cannot make these kinds of evolutions. Uh, and the other idea is automation is going to improve my uh, cost structure, optimize my business. Um, and if you um, think about, uh, you know, uh, probe a little further on what automation means, uh, people can say uh, things like, uh, oh, you know, I want to be able to um, uh, move towards a dark knob, a zero touch, you know, these kinds of terms are thrown. Um, so whatever is the kind of definition of automation in whatever context, uh, we like to think about automation in a very, very simple, straightforward way. Um, and you can think of automation as um, not a, a, a piece of software. Uh, it's not some sort of uh, system, but really you can break it down into three components, code, data, and process. Right? So, uh, so you can think of automation having these three components. Uh, and the three components uh, are really about, you know, when I say code, I, I talk about um, platforms uh, or solutions which are solving certain specific problems. So an example would be anomaly detection or forecasting. This is what we focus as Anadot, but there could be others, recommendation, um, even simple you know, visualization platforms could be considered to be part of this uh, component of code. And then of course, there's the data piece. So automation is, lives and breathes using data. So code plus data um, is good, but uh, really what makes the whole process work is uh, the, the, the organizational skills, the workflows, the development, et cetera. So, so these three components essentially form what we call automation. Uh, and obviously uh, you solve uh, problems, uh, whether they're real-time problems uh, or non-real-time. So an example of non-real-time is you want to build a system that will tell you all the candidate sites to upgrade in the next six months uh, in your radio network. Now that's a problem that doesn't have to be solved in the next one minute, but uh, you know it can be solved um, you know in a non real time manner. And near real time uh, automation is to be able to detect issues in your network, run automated tests, and fix them. Um, and that can't wait till tomorrow; it needs to be done today. So uh, putting all this together, uh, automation equals code plus data plus process. Um, and you think of automation as near real time or, or non real time. Uh, so the, 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 the next piece is really, you know, um, how do we put all this together? Uh, and the focus of today's webinar is the data piece. So the question really is about how do we bring all this together um, by building uh, efficient data pipelines? Right? Uh, so we have code there, we have uh, an understanding of the process, but you know, if you don't have good, efficient data pipelines, then this automation doesn't work, whether it's near real time or non real time. Okay, so, uh, so let's talk about uh, data and data pipelines. Uh, and I'll focus uh, a little bit of this discussion around uh, the telco uh, environment. Uh, the telco environment has some unique challenges. Um, if you think about uh, telcos, um, right now, you know, they, I would argue that they're the, one of the largest producers of uh, data um, um, other than maybe astronomy, right? Uh, we think of big data, um, you know, when we think about internet companies, but 
uh, telcos collectively generate large volumes of data. Um, there's plenty of data which is coming near real time. So you think of you know any country you're in, think of the number of base stations they have, think of the the number of subscribers they have, uh, think of the number of interactions they're having with their subscribers. All that is very very large uh, data. Now uh, in a in a telco environment and you know in a network context. Um, you know, you have uh, an architecture which is moving towards, um, uh, you know, open framework. Uh, what I mean is to use virtual machines, containers, uh, uh, you know, things which uh, break up the whole uh, data stack. Uh, you know, you have still legacy or proprietary elements. So this is these are router switches provided by one vendor or multiple vendors um, that need to be monitored. Um, and the other uh, challenge in uh, telcos is, you know, you have a very large distributed environment. So, you know, think of your uh, fiber network or radio network. It's geographically spread in working in all kinds of environments. And the format and granularity of the data arriving is, uh, is very, very um, um, different and vast, right? Uh, so some generate data every you know, minute and some generate every 15 minutes. Um, so, so you have that uh, aspect and then you have multiple vendors. So if you look at a uh, telco network, it's highly um, multi-vendor uh, and each vendor will have uh, data in their own proprietary formats. Uh, data could be messy. Uh, you know, if you go to two radio vendors, they can't um, they don't have the same calculation of KPIs, their counter structure is different, and uh, you know you constantly upgrade the network from one version to the other and therefore data is constantly shifting. Um, and in telco, because it's a highly regulated industry, there's privacy concerns and uh, regulatory concerns, so, so you have to deal with uh, all these challenges. So, uh, so given that you know you have a variety, velocity, volume, um, you, you know these are these are things you have to deal with in a in a data uh, in a telco data environment. Um, the next question is, you know, how can you take raw data being generated by your domains? Uh, and what I mean by domain is you know, radio, core network, customer care, customer experience. Those are all domains. Um, so this on, is happening uh, on the left-hand side. Um, and the value creation from this data is on the right-hand side. So these are all you know, the code part that I talked about. Um, and so in the middle are the data pipelines. And on top are, is the, is the people, the process. Uh, so the question now is, uh, how can we build robust, efficient, scalable data pipelines? Um, because uh, the idea is that the value creation uh, can only happen if you have good stable data pipelines, but this cannot be uh, at, a, at a high cost and it, it, it needs to be scalable, right? So this is kind of the, the real challenge uh, across the entire industry. So uh, the next part is really, you know, what, what, you know, how do we build these data pipelines, which are scalable, efficient, robust? Uh, so if you think about what's, uh, what typically happens in a telco environment is that, let's say you have a automation solution that you're trying to build. And this solution needs data. Uh, today, this uh, automation function, um, let's say you know you are building uh, a, a recommendation or uh, some sort of uh, classification uh, task um, you would then have to go and uh, bring data from a particular domain uh, pull data uh, write some code uh, to normalize the data and use it in the format that you you need it to be so uh, each automation function goes to each domain and then pulls data uh, and starts to use it. Now, obviously, you know, this is more a request-driven process. So the idea here is that you've got an automation function and it goes to say, well, let's say the RAN, the radio access network, 
pulls data and does something. Another function might have to use a little bit of the RAN data and the core the network data and it goes and builds something uh, to pull data from these two domains and so on. So, so it, typically uh, the automation function is requesting data from each domain um, and, and it's typically pulled, right? Uh, and this is um, very, very expensive and fragile. Right, so uh, you know, you you change something in the domain, then it breaks a whole bunch of uh, different automation functions. You may have to rewrite your code. Um, so this is simply not as scalable. So the single um, uh, biggest pivot or starting point in building scalable, efficient data pipelines is to migrate to an event-driven uh, architecture. So what do I mean by event-driven architecture? Is that the domain uh, broadcasts this data. So, so the idea is that uh, your automation functions essentially are, are consumers of this data and your domain is broadcasting this data in whatever format, raw process format, uh, using streaming, let's say um, provisionally streaming technologies. But the idea is that now your domain becomes, uh, the data from your domain is available to everybody in the organization. So anybody could go and become a consumer and consume this data. So this is um, a really, really important uh, pivot uh, that you need to make uh, when you're thinking about building data pipelines. Um, we've seen um, our customers start out in this way um, and then come to the realization that uh, you know uh, every time a, a you know they embark on an automation project they repeat a lot of tasks but when you implement um, a, a event driven solution uh, then the the implementation the ability to combine and match mix and match data becomes really really powerful um, and we are starting to see um, a lot of uh, telcos, small and large, starting to think about how to implement this at industrial scale. So to be able to say from day one, uh, all the data going to automation functions is going to be through this kind of event-driven architecture, okay? So this is kind of the single biggest change uh, that needs to take place. Uh, now, um, you know, in the general internet world, um, this is more common, but um, in the telco world, uh, you know, it's being implemented, but it needs to be uh, implemented across every possible uh, domain and needs to be scaled up. So, uh, so the general uh, layout would be the domain uh, creates that data. It puts it through some sort of mediation layer um, and then it creates a, a stream or an event uh, that's available to um, everybody you can consume. Um, so you can now start to build um, a system on uh, automation function, which can exploit now data from every domain. Uh, so all you have to do is to understand uh, the structure of the data um, and then start to consume this data. So this uh, is um, uh, the first part. Um, and then the second part is, um, you know, typically this data is, is uh, raw data. It needs to be processed. Uh, so think of uh, in the telco world, you have this notion of counters and KPIs. Uh, and what you want is uh, maybe raw data is not, um, uh, something you always need for all these functions. You need uh, aggregated or pre-computed data. So you need to do this um, in near real time, right? So to do near real time automation, you need to be able to um, uh, do the, 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 the computations um, and then make it available, right? So, so, the, so the idea is to do these computations using um, uh, you know, Flink or Spark, or use the OLAP DB. Um, and then uh, once you do the computations, you, you push the near real-time process data uh, to your automated functions, okay? So, so the, the problem now you've solved is you, you are now able to take data from every domain 
um, be able to uh, aggregate, do computations in near real time and push data so that you know you, your automation functions can act on it. Um, so the, the the temptation we've seen is that you know do you do this computations in Hadoop or or a data lake, um, and and that's okay, uh, but it adds often delay for near real time tasks, right? So um, if you have to do an aggregation and that aggregation job gets done two hours uh, later, then uh, some of these um, functions cannot exploit the data and the value of that data diminishes rapidly. So then um, obviously, you know, you still have to write some of this data to a data lake, which can then be accessed uh, for, for say non real time data uh, functions, uh, which can be accessed from the data lake. Okay, so, so the kind of uh, summary of this is to first uh, move towards a event driven architecture uh, perform uh, computations uh, in line uh, and push the, the, the process data um, to these automation functions. Very rarely, um, you really need to look at all the raw data. Typically, you, you know, you're working on some of the process data. Uh, and of course, uh, you always want to store some of this data for uh, non-real-time tasks, okay? So, uh, so this is kind of, these are some of the kind of foundational uh, building blocks uh, of how you would uh, think about uh, building robust pipelines. And now robust because um, you know, you're, you're now able to have a common design pattern across all your domains. You're able to deliver real-time data to your automation functions, um, and then um, to be able to um, write to a data lake so that you know, it doesn't get expensive, right? So, you know, you want to write uh, some computed uh, um, uh, values or, or, or uh, computed data into a data lake rather than having the data lake have everything raw. Um, so that's kind of uh, an expensive idea. And when you move to the cloud, public cloud, that becomes even more challenging. So, so this is kind of uh, the experience we've had um, working with a whole bunch of customers. Uh, they usually start out saying, uh, you know, my data is in SQL. Um, and then they realize that, um, you know, that, that has its own uh, challenges uh, to, to scale that up. Um, uh, or, you know, my data is in CSV files and it, it becomes a challenge for everybody to start um, consuming those CSV files. So, so, uh, so this is kind of uh, the, the pivot they make. They, they start to think about uh, streaming. They start to think about compu computing things in near real time um, and writing efficiently to the data lake uh, and only writing things that are really, really useful for um, non-real time uh, functions. So once uh, you are done, um, you know, what else? You know, let's assume you built uh, a quality data pipeline. Um, one of the things that we often find is that uh, people, uh, the organizations don't think deep enough about data quality. Uh, there are many other topics like data lineage. Um, that's an important um, uh, topic uh, having a data catalog so that everybody knows what what these uh, data uh, the topics contain and you know how do you define a specific field etc. But for for this whole automation to work robustly, uh, you need data quality. So what do I mean by data quality is um, you know we kind of think that once we built the data pipes, um, you know the data flowing is always reliable. And the answer often is that, um, yes, it's reliable for the first 10 days, but something happens to data, right? Uh, pipelines break, uh, data distribution changes, or you get uh, null values. So these are all data quality problems. Um, and and the, uh, the challenge of data quality is not just a technical challenge. So in other words, um, you know, if you write some code or uh, do some checks, um, you, you can identify data quality. That's not the case. 
um, the, 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 the challenge is that when you're working in an organization with, um, you know, uh, domain owners, people who run the uh, actual network, uh, and then the people who engineer these pipelines, who is responsible when data uh, is, is poor, data is of poor color? Is it the data engineering community or the, the source, um, or, you know, is it the data science community or the consumers of the data? You know, so there are some organizational aspects that need to be worked out. Um, and then the idea is, uh, the secondary idea is, you know, how do you monitor data quality in, in real time? So uh, a classic thing is that, uh, you know, data quality is bad uh, and your automation functions are making some decisions. Uh, and then uh, the organization is saying, well, you know, this does not make sense. And then when you think about it, the data has been bad for a week. Uh, and that means that everything that you base this, uh, your decision on this bad data can be thrown out of the window. Uh, so therefore, you know, you need tools to monitor data quality in near real time. And finally, uh, governance. So when things break, um, you know, who's accountable for it, you know, how quickly can you fix it? So data quality, you know, is a really, really important topic. Uh, and uh, often, uh, you know, you, you do all the hard work of engineering these data pipelines, uh, and then you realize that uh, not enough time has been spent on monitoring data quality. So, um, so with that, um, you know, let's kind of wrap up and kind of go through some, um, some summary uh, statements. Um, so I think, um, you know, looking at where we are in the telco industry, uh, automation is going to be a, a, a big part of all the network transformations that are happening. Um, and, um, you know, automation, as I discussed, is really three parts, code, data, and process. Um, and there are solutions and platforms, you know, that can deal with specific automation problems. Uh, you know, there are ways you can uh, evolve the organization to deal with automation, uh, but data pipelines are critical, right? Um, so if you have very, very weak and fragile data pipelines, no matter how great your ideas about automation are, um, you'll always be patching things and um, you know, trying to, you know, put things together when they break. So the key pivots um, to be made in building these robust, uh, scalable, efficient pipelines are one is, uh, you know, you have to start thinking about an event-driven architecture uh, from day one. Uh, so when you receive data, um, your responsibility should be to be, to be able to um, share this data across the entire organization. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, don't store it in a CSV file and lock it up in a server or don't put it in a database that, you know, uh, can't be accessed widely, uh, make it available uh, through streaming um, event driven uh, architecture. The second is, uh, you know, people think about, uh, you know, how do we then uh, do the computations um, you know, and the temptation is to write to a data lake uh, and then uh, do the computations, but computations should be made on the fly uh, because, um, you know, that's kind of where the automation functions can exploit the value of the data, um, you know, and you should hand off uh, always using some sort of streaming technology. Kafka is one choice, but, um, you know, so that, uh, Know, the entire organization can again exploit uh, the raw data, the process data, um, uh, and 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 make the automation work. Uh, and finally, um, you know, writing uh, to the data lake uh, so that you can use this data for non-real-time queries. Right. So these are kind of the key summary statements on uh, what we see as, um, let's say. Uh, industry trends, uh, things that our customers are, are working through. Um, and in some cases, our customers have actually built this architecture successfully 
and are, are now focusing more on you know, how to scale this up, how to uh, provide additional value through automation functions. Um, and finally, uh, data quality monitoring is essential. Uh, this is a, a big piece uh, of the data engineering uh, discipline. Uh, there are other pieces, but uh, for us, um, as, as Anadot, you know, we are, we are consumers of the data. Uh, for us, uh, this is um, super, super important. If the data quality is bad, it doesn't matter how great Anadot's algorithms are, you know, you get subpar results from uh, your your automation. So, so this is kind of uh, the summary. Um, I think uh, we'll we'll pause for uh, a Q and A. Um, if we can't get to all your questions, um, please email me, uh, and I will uh, respond to each of these questions. Thank you so much, Vikram. Um, so here are some of the questions that come up have come up throughout the session. Um, the first one is, how do you monitor data quality? Right. Um, so uh, first of all, you know what what is kind of data quality? I mean, the, it it really kind of depends on on um, you know what you're trying to do with the data. So a, an example of you know uh, data quality is uh, let's say you know you are um, uh, you know, computing. Um, uh, you know, you 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 build some uh, automation function, um, and you uh, built it using some sort of data model, um, and suddenly the distribution of that data um, uh, changes, right? Um, and that's uh, you know that throws the model off. You get the wrong decisions, but it turns out that. Uh, you know, because of some data quality issue, you know, you're getting a whole bunch of NAs. Um, so, you know, the the idea is, you know, how do you quickly get to those issues um, and, and identify those data quality problems and fix them? Now, uh, what we are seeing as Anadot is that a lot of our customers are saying, you know, what if we could use something like an anomaly detection um, or component to monitoring uh, our data pipelines. So uh, an idea would be, for example, a simple kind of example would be, let's say, um, you know, um, your uh, streaming event should have, you know, you know, 100 data points every minute. Um, so what we do is we do anomaly detection on those in, in real time, and let's say you know you have a billion data points, then you know there's something wrong. If you have three data points, you know something's wrong. So we send out automated alerts to our customers saying, you know, the number of expected data points is below normal. Look into it. And what our customers are doing is getting onto the the job of examining data quality. Um, so data pipelines breaking. So in other words, data not being sent from the source. Um, and you know, in 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 telco uh, uh, networks, it happens a lot. So you can imagine, and there's a base station power outage. Uh, the base station is dead. It's not going to be sending any data. Um, so you want to know quickly, you know, why data is not coming, and then to be able to correlate that with other metrics to say, oh, okay, you know, there's a power outage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and the next question we have is, how does the current data availability support the effort to implement either AI or um, artificial intelligence or machine learning? Right, so I think um, the kind of uh, two parts to, you know, how quickly the data is available, it makes, uh, creates that value, right? So if you, if you think about, uh, machine learning um, and and actually a lot of the machine learning that happens in the real world um, is working on uh, non real time data. So in other words, they're doing machine learning on in batch batch modes. Um, so if you think about uh, recommendations for products, um, you know those things happen in in batches. Uh, so you know data arrives, you run your algorithms against the data, and then you have a set of recommendations. So then when your users visit your site, you show these recommendations and then you, you rerun it uh, every few hours. 
in, in telco, uh, you know, the data is happening in near real time uh, and you have to make automation decisions in near real time. So, um, and, and, you know, the value of uh, running machine learning and AI in near real time uh, means that, you know, you are able to really, really um, extract more uh, value out of that data. Um, a simple example is we go to an e-commerce website, for example, and, uh, you know, they don't, they don't uh, know you at all uh, from previous experience. Um, you know, their recommendations are, are, are going to be some generic recommendations initially. But imagine, you know, after a few clicks you made, uh, they're able to quickly, uh, you know, recommend the most appropriate things. That has immense value. So in, in, in the telco world, um, if, um, you know, you can work on real-time data and you can, for example, uh, you know, predict or detect or forecast in near real time that has had significant value. Um, so we as Anadoc, uh, of course, work on real time data. Uh, so we are performing this task of anomaly detection um, in near real time uh, at very large scale. Uh, so for us, we our machine learning is working in near real time and the value from our system is to be able to detect anomalies you know, within a minute. Um, and so for us, uh, you know, data must work in near real time and for data to work, you need to make sure that it's stable and robust and reliable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and unfortunately, we only have time for one last question. And that is, what are some of the challenges that you see with data, pi data pipelines, sorry? Right. Um, so, um, you know, the, the general idea uh, is that, you know, when we start working with customers, uh, they have many, many different domains. So if you think about a typical mobile network operator, you know, they have a radio network, but when you dig deeper, they have 2G, 3G, 4G, and now 5G. And all of them have a different way of collecting data, uh, different set of KPI definitions, um, you know, uh, multi-vendors, uh, networks, and so on. Uh, and then you move to the transport, it's the same idea, you know, you have microwave, you have, you know, fiber, and then you have a core network, you have many different routing, switching, uh, et cetera. So, uh, you know, so what our customers try and do initially is to build uh, a pipeline for radio, a pipeline for, you um, uh, transport and so on. So when, when that happens, uh, this kind of uh, sequential idea of building uh, a pipeline per domain uh, for us as Anadot to exploit uh, suddenly starts to break down, right? Because, um, you know, if you're trying to understand where the anomaly is in the network, you need data from the radio, transport, core network, all reliably coming to Anadot. And if one of those pipelines, it breaks or doesn't work or it doesn't scale, um, then you know, you, the value of what we do as Anadar diminishes. So, um, so typically, you know, the, these are the, some of the challenges that we encounter. Um, and then uh, you know, when we uh, look at data quality, um, so typically, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the data coming from the network um, can vary a lot, right? Because you're, you're doing um, maintenance activities, you're bringing up new elements. Uh, so the data keeps changing and shifting. Um, and so uh, you need a system that uh, can make sure that, you know, the data quality is good and also on the, uh, let's say, automation function side, you need to have systems that can reliably deal with changing data, right? Um, so uh, really, the, the, to summarize, the main challenges are, you know, uh, you know building robust pipelines uh, using uh, an event-driven approach is what, um, you know, we, you know, our customers 
try and work, are, are moving in that direction. Uh, but we often see a lot of problems when you start to, uh, you know, have individuals pulling data and that gets very expensive. The platform cannot scale to have so many different functions polling data. So these are some of the typical challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Vikram. And thank you everyone again for attending. Um, as I mentioned, the webinar recording will be sent to you in the next few days. And of course, if you have any further questions, as Vikram mentioned, you have his email right there. And you can reach out to any other Anadot team members as well. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I hope to see you again in another one of our webinars soon. Thank you.